Hey, hey, Doug Greathouse here, host of the Entrepreneur Journey Podcast. And before we get into another amazing interview with an incredible entrepreneur, I wanted to invite you to the Trailblazer Mastermind community. What that community community is, is a community of amazing entrepreneurs, just like the ones that you've seen me interview on the podcast, the six and seven figure entrepreneurs. You'll get to learn from and engage with those entrepreneurs, uh, and as well as many other entrepreneurs. We have a weekly networking event in there where you will meet the people that are seeking you and that you are seeking, meaning your next podcast guest, or if you want to be on a podcast, your clients, joint ventures, affiliates, we make those connections happen inside the Trailblazer Mastermind at the Entrepreneur Connect. We also have a monthly mastermind called the Trailblazer Mastermind. It's a feet to the fire style mastermind, meaning the goals that you have set for yourself and your business, you have a mastermind that is going to hold you accountable and help you hit those goals. Uh, you also learn what is ha- what is working inside of other coaching businesses to help them grow. So that's not all. We also have the sales site all-in-one marketing platform, which you will get access to as a member of the Trailblazer Mastermind. Uh, it has everything that you need to grow your coaching business from funnels, you can host your website there, uh, social planner, email automation, SMS automation, sales pipeline, everything, literally everything you could possibly need to market and grow your coaching business is inside that uh, platform. So you'll get access to that. There's also contests and giveaways. There's the expert training library uh, where we have experts. If you want to launch and grow your next, po- grow your podcast, if you want to s- write a bestseller, those experts are going to be inside of the mastermind and you can learn from them and grow. Um, and in addition, not last but not certainly not least, there's the Raise Your Revenue course, the course by uh, me and my team that we put together to help you hit your five-figure consistent months in your business and then grow from there. So this is a roadmap to get you to that first five-figure month, lay the proper foundation, and you can grow from there. So there, there's so much more. Go check it out. It's at mastermind.salesite.com. And <laughs> All right, we are live on my Facebook profile. And I am so excited to have Tammy Fink with me today. Um, I've been following Tammy for a while now. Um, she's probably probably stalking her a little bit. We got before yesterday. We hadn't really talked, um, but I am a big fan of everything that she does. Um, she she's going to talk about all of that, and we're going to get into her entrepreneur journey. And but first, we're going to start with some icebreaker questions. But before we get into that, I want you to give a brief introduction of who you are. I love brief, number one. (laughs) So I'm Tammy Fink. I'm the author of The Wow Factor. I'm a B2B consultant around all things client retention and customer experience. I've had 30 years of experience in marketing and design. And that's it. Let's get started. (laughs) Yeah, nice. So you're going to learn a lot more about exactly how awesome Tammy is in just a little bit. I did want to kind of preface it with kind of your, the generalization of what you do, but um, all, the, all the excitement that is Tammy Fink is, is, is coming your way. So uh, without further ado, let's get into that. So I start off with some kind of getting to know you icebreaker questions, just to kind of not make it feel so businessy at the beginning of the interviews. So um, my first question for you is, what is the most adventurous thing you've done outside of your professional life? You know, that, that's a that's a big question because I'm all, all about the adventure, all about expanding my horizons and all of that. In 1985, the one thing that occurs, 1985, I was graduated high school. I know I, I don't look that old, but it, it's true. Graduated high school and I went and lived in Haiti for a few wow. months to see whether or not I wanted to be um, an evangelist over there or work with, I did not. <laughs> decided wow. that was that was not my <laughs> my calling at all but i i spent some time over there and so haiti and and the haitian people are are really dear dear to my heart um and and i love them i learned so much and i think that you know i think people should get to travel and do that when they're young because i think it really does color what you do from that point forward so that's one of my cool things i also i also spent a day at a nudist colony but that's oh. like a whole other conversation <laughs> okay um let, let's let's focus on the on the haiti part um just just for a second um i agree with you that i think um i i did not do anything quite as adventurous when i was young but i agree with you that that is an awesome time to do that uh, when you're younger so that you can get exposed to that kind of thing and travel, travel when you're young, learn about other cultures, um, because 
too often kids are kept in this bubble, right? And they don't even know what the world is like outside of that bubble until they actually go there. Well, and the weird thing I think now, don't you think that now we're all in our phones, we are all global, but we're global in this little box, right? Mm -hmm. And so really, I mean, until you get boots on the ground, until you see people eyeball to eyeball, you really just don't have that same feeling until you've actually experienced what it's like and how even our culture here affects people in third world countries because they hear all about you know, the U S and, and all the things. And so there's a lot of miscommunication. There's a lot of things all the way through that, that you can only learn by being, like I said, boots on the ground. Yeah. It's very hard to have empathy with a screen, like with a person on a screen. Um, it's, it, it just becomes a whole different thing when you're actually in the element. So mm -hmm. yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, my next question for you is if you could travel back in time and give your younger self any advice, what would that advice be? You know, I think I would have embraced the entrepreneurial spirit earlier. I went to college. I, I have about, I had almost four years in college, ended up getting married, having babies, all the things. And I went back and got an associate's degree. And I had so many things tied up in that education piece that I just didn't know how else to do it. Like that there was another option. And I wish that I had learned that earlier you know, I still may have gone to college, but I probably would have done things a little differently knowing where I was going to be at this stage because, you know, hindsight's <laughs> nuisance, right? But it's always <laughs> easier to see things a little higher up on the mountain, a little further down the road when you've been there. Very, very true. I, this question came to mind as you were saying that. So what do you, what do you, what was your view of entrepreneurship? If you can remember back then, before you got into it, what kind of were your, was your view of entrepreneurship? Oh, you know, and, and I talk about this a little bit in, in my book. Um, I had my folk, my folks, my parents were, were blue collar workers. Um, we had a farm. We did that kind of, that kind of work all the time. Number one, you had to work all the time. You, you worked for a nine to five and then you came home and you had chores and you had all the other things. You went to school, you came home, you had chores. So I was working all the time. I had an uncle that ran a, um, First, he had a lumber yard and then it became it like pivoted, right? It, then it became like a hardware store. Then Walmart came in the neighborhood. Then he became, he started doing antiques. I don't know. There was always this pivoting. <laughs> he was always, I always felt like he was always looking for that next thing because whatever it was that he was doing wasn't working. And that was mm -hmm. my, it wasn't really entrepreneur, right? It was like small business, but it was like he worked so hard. Um, and I worked summers for him, but that was my only indication of what you know, online or what entrepreneurship, small business owning was like. And now it's completely different. Like what I'm doing, I didn't even know there was a possibility of doing mm -hmm. what I'm doing. I didn't even think that there was an inkling. It wasn't anything. I loved computers, but other than that, I didn't have any kind of concept of what an entrepreneur, or if I did, it was most of these people are broke, <laughs> you know, yeah. they're not making money. They're, they're struggling. So, so advice for young people um, in that to me is get exposed to entrepreneurship, but not just, not just one family member or not. There, there are different ways that entrepreneurship is done. Right. Um, and different, different success levels. Right. So get, so get exposed. Absolutely. And, and now that, I mean, it's so exciting I, and I can't wait to get into it, but it's so exciting. I think for young people today, yes. it is amazing. The opportunities that are out there. Awesome. Um, so I, I love this next question. Um, I've never asked anybody this question on, on one of these calls. So if you were a fictional character or celebrity um, with your loud, lovable, <laughs> and full of laughs personality, who do you, which fictional character or celebrity do you think best embodies that? You know, I, I thought about this and I thought it was kind of funny. I liked Lucille Ball. Mm. And I know that she wasn't necessarily that character, um, you know, all the time, but I really liked how that she was so funny. And so we had so many laughs, um, but she also behind the scenes, she was like an incredible businesswoman, mm -hmm. absolutely incredible. And even though she played, you know, that ditzy character and stuff, not necessarily my favorite, but I, I know I laughed so hard with her and Carol Burnett is another one. Mm again that these these entertainers so more of that entertainment piece um but i will tell you 
actually I actually love um, Steve Martin as well. Oh yeah. And I took his master class and I oh. learned what it was amazing what all I learned. And it really wasn't about being a comedian, what I learned from taking his class. So there's I some saw, really cool characters out there, but it's all about making people laugh and happy. Yeah, I saw that master class and I was like, I bet that is really, really good. He's a different kind of comedian, a different kind of thinker um, than the typical. Um, and I and I was really uh, drawn to that. So oh, there's a whole yeah, there's a whole conversation. What I learned about Mike, just a quick synopsis. What I learned about that, and I've talked about it, and you know, when I've done speaking, is that Steve Martin wasn't a comedian when he started like we all think that that's where he started like he got his big break it was a thing he was not he was a writer before he was a comedian oh. and it's amazing how far that took him just being it falling into that but like I said when they started telling him, you need to do that you know can you step into these roles can you write comedy can you do these things he was not sure of himself at all you know, which is really hard mm. to look and we think about Saturday Night Live and all the different things. But it was really the fact that he started off not having a clue as to what he was doing when he got started. And wow. I love that story. Yeah, he, he comes across on stage of ha as having no fear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, really, really amazing. Um, so now please share one interesting hobby or talent that most people might not know that you have. Well, I'm an avid pickleball player. Oh, I start. I started that about three years ago, and I'm completely addicted. I even got my husband involved, so we play pickleball together several times a week. <laughs> so nice, that's nice. probably that's something that's fun that, that I don't talk about a lot. Uh, but it does get me out from behind the computer. It does give me another uh, social outlet that that's not completely business related. So, yeah, yeah. I love that. Th that is a weakness for me. Um not in the fact that I, that I love it and play it. It's because it's like, I tried to play tennis young when I was uh, growing up with my mom and my mom refused to play with me anymore because I would hit the ball over the fence. Um, <laughs> I was used to playing baseball. Um, and then I, I hated, never... I hated tennis. I really, really did. And this was not, I did not embrace it. My neighbor told me about it for, I don't know, probably a couple of years before I actually started. Um, and then I started and then I got the racket and then I bought the shoes. So once you buy the shoes, you're committed yep, at that yep. point. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Nice. Nice. Um, so this is one of my favorite parts of the interview. It's called the fill in the blank question It's because I usually get such great answers and it's not usually the answer I expect. <laughs> uh, your, and I imagine that's definitely going to happen here. Uh, your fill in the blank question is create, creating a unique customer experience is, is essential because. Okay. Creating a unique customer experience is essential because you, in this day and age, right? You, it's really hard to stand out right? People are looking at, they want to, they want to be different. They're worried about the co competition. Doesn't everybody sell the same things? This was some of the problems that we have. When you create a unique customer experience, all of a sudden the competition doesn't matter because nobody is going to do it exactly the same way that you do it. Even if you're selling the exact same thing right now, you can put your touch on it. That really makes an impact and starts building it from your clients right? And what you offer is this amazing combination that becomes your wow factor, right? Yeah. So that's why. Yeah. Well, yeah. And I, I love how you open that up is because that is the mentality. It seems like the, the, the market is flooded and there's so many copycats and that's because they're, they're doing the same thing and they're not really trying to stand out. Um, and we're going to get into how you can help them stand out. Um, here in just a little while. But before we do that, I want to dive into your story because it's called the entrepreneur journey. So let's talk about your journey a little bit. Like you, you referenced a little bit of, of your exposure to entrepreneurship. And now I want to know, like, what was your, did you have a job first and then kind of get into entrepreneurship? How did that journey come about and kind of ups and downs and whatever you want to tell us? <laughs> okay. And you watched my time because I, I can go, I can go <laughs> long on this. Okay. You know, Here's the thing that most people, after they've met me, they, they didn't really get at the beginning of the story. And I think it's this. I wasn't wanting to be an entrepreneur. I never dreamed of it, right? I did dream of quitting my day job, which is not the same thing at all. <laughs> Let's not <laughs> right. even confuse that. <laughs> right. But, you know, I work harder for myself than I ever did for anybody else. So 
I was working um, in marketing and design. I'd worked for publishing companies. I worked as a corporate designer. And in 2004, my husband um, relocated us to Branson, Missouri. And that's where we're currently at. We've been here almost 20 years now. It's crazy. But we moved here and I convinced the company that I was working for as a corporate designer to keep me on while they were replacing me. I convinced them to sell me my computer. I convinced them we could do all of this online. This is before Zoom was sexy, right? This is before there was all of this, these tools, but they, they took it on and it took them a year to replace me. And when they, by the time they had me replaced, I had my own client base, national, international. You know, I decided I, I wanted to work with some amazing companies. Uh, I got to work um, at, for um, Hershey's and Cinnabon. I got to work for some big name Hewlett Packard, which basically it sounds it sounds really cool. But the behind the scenes is I just worked with their attorneys. <laughs> they just said <laughs> yes, you can do this. No, you can't do that. Um, and we we developed you know projects for them. So I've gotten to work with some really cool big names that I never would have done you know working for somebody else. And I think that for me, uh, you know, going, I say I go, I went over the wall, right? I went over the corporate wall and I really felt that way. I did not want to go back. Um, I've had a few little part-time jobs here and there um, over the last 20 years, but mainly I don't have a, a backup plan. I mean, this is the plan. This is what I do. I have learned to pivot. Mm -hmm. Pivoting has been huge, but you know, I had everything that I have done up to this point even in small jobs in college, I think have made it so that I could do what I do now really, really well. Right. Yeah. So wow. I think that that's, that's the big thing with it. It's, you just never know. It's jumped without a parachute, right? You said totally. you didn't have a backup. Built plan. it on the way down. That's <laughs> yep, yep. absolutely, absolutely the truth. Yeah. It, it, I, and that is the story with so many entrepreneurs. Like once you get the bug and once you get into it, uh, it's hard to ever go back. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's... It, no, it really is. And not everybody gets this. I have a sister that I hired and I kept her on as a designer um, and, and trained her. She's gone on and she works for another company now locally. Um, she does not have the entrepreneur bug. I've tried, you know, and it's just, it's, I don't think she has that. She's thought about it over the years coming up with her own thing. And I think that's part of it too, is like, you can't tell, so you can't really tell an entrepreneur what it is they're going to do. Right. <laughs> that's, that's, that's where, that's one of the reasons we're where we are, but you know, you can see it in other people and you can have it hopes and dreams that they can do things. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, some people, some people are cut out to be entrepreneurs and some people aren't. I, to I totally agree with that. Um, and, you know, it, they usually find out early on that, oh, I, this isn't what I expected it to be <laughs> if, right? if they try it. It's not it's quitting not... your day job. It's not, <laughs> right. it's not just, you know, getting to, getting to lay around. I used to say, I wanted to, I, I thought, and, and I'll quick, I thought that the, my biggest struggle would be this. I figured that I would lay around and sleep to like noon every day. Cause that's what I wanted to do when <laughs> I was working nine to five. And, you know, nobody would be in charge of my time and I would sleep and that, that that would be a struggle. I knew that I couldn't do that and have a business, but I didn't, I didn't know, you know, that was never, that was never been the problem at all. The, actually the opposite is true. One of my biggest struggles as an entrepreneur is knowing when to shut down, when to turn it off. Yeah. Yeah. That's how you right? can tell, like, but that's how, also, I think how you can tell the entrepreneurs that are going to make it because they, they proceed at all costs, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's, right. It's, just, it's just amazing. So, wow, I, I love that. I love that. Um, now I really want to dive into what you're really good at. Let's get into your expertise. Let's talk about um, your book. Let's talk about what you do and how you help people create amazing experiences. My first question on that, what is the secret to creating amazing customer experiences? You're going to love this one because here's the, here's the deal, Doug. What I measure all of our experiences by are M&Ms. Oh. <laughs> Not regular M&Ms. <laughs> if your experience it has to be both meaningful mm. and memorable, right? When mm. we're developing things, it's about the customer. It's client centric. It's customer first, 
right? So we're looking at it. So everything, all your touch points, all the things that you build, all the connections with them. If you start looking at it with that idea, is this meaningful? Is it memorable? Is it something they're going to take home with them? It changes the entire experience for the customer and for yourself. Yeah. I, I think about all the times that um, I've interacted with a brand and I can say, oh, I, they really wowed me, right? They, they gave me a memorable experience. And that's something that I go and tell, I go and talk about. Uh, yep. Whereas if it's just the ordinary everyday experience of what someone does, like what a company does, okay, it's okay. It's great. It's, they did all right. I'll take, but... it. I'll, I'll take it one step further. And I say this all the time, Doug, people, your customers want to be involved with your story more than they want to be a part of your brand. And that's hard. I've designed, I've spent, I've made thousands, tens of thousands of dollars making logos. I get it. I understand that part of it. But at the end of the day, you have to be able to have the story that people want to be involved with. Then they're telling the stories, right? Then they're putting that out there. Then you're getting referrals, right? I have a great quick, quick story about a referral. And I, and I share about this in, in the wow factor book, but I went to, um, I had a mastermind, uh, a gentleman put together a mastermind in Utah a couple, three years ago. And I, they flew me out there to talk and speak at their, at their event, which was phenomenal. But they, I flew into Utah, had never been there. And I flew in at night. So I didn't get to see, had no idea, you know, what was going on. Got in my Uber, um, the driver, I told him, you know, I'd never been to Utah before here is. He did this play-by-play. -play. It was like a 20-minute drive. And he did this play-by-play -play showing me like the lights. Like, see, see where those strips of lights are. That's where the that's where the cathedral is. That's where the temples are. See, this, this is where they they have the salt mines. All of this stuff he was just showing me. And it was so, I was just engaged because there was nothing you could really see, but just the way he told the story. So when we got to the, when we got to the to the venue, the hotel, he uh, let me out, put my suitcase down. I asked him. I said, this has been the best trip ever. I said, tell me, what can I do for you? Right. What can I do for you? You know, obviously there would be a tip involved, all, you know, the normal things, but I said, what can I do to you that would make this difference? And you could just tell by his whole demeanor, no one had ever asked him that. Right. He was not prepared for what can you do for me? You know, I, I mean, I was basically giving him a blank check. We could have done a video together. We could have done, you know, I don't know, sung show tunes, whatever <laughs> it was that would have helped him. He had somebody in front of him with that. So as you're kind of putting this together and you're looking at it and you're wanting referrals and you're wanting these things, you need to know what it is that you need from people so that you can further your, your entrepreneurial journey. Right. Yeah. 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 Wow. Nice. Uh, so my next question is, what are the proven client first practices that will increase revenue and retention? You know, people, when we're looking at this, and, and we'll get into a little bit, of, I think there's, we'll talk a little bit about swag later, but when people are getting into this and they're putting things together, again, we're going back to that client centric connection. What is it that they want from you, right? What are the things that we can do that aren't just nice to haves? You can actually build, one of my biggest secrets is build these connection points, these touch points into whatever service, whatever product that you're providing. Some of the things that we start off, you know, everybody does the same thing. There's a beginning, a middle and end to every customer interaction. There's three touch points right there. You know, so as you're developing this, you start taking a look and start thinking about it a little bit differently Then all of a sudden it's about the customer experience, right? It's not just about it's how to sell this. The secret to it is that you want to build these relationships with people because at the end of the day, right, you have friends, you have people that you can count on. You have people that you can call in and say, this is what we need. And it's not just about the numbers. And we get so caught up with the numbers of how many people can, how many likes, follows can we get? <laughs> what are the, you know, Facebook algorithms? What are all the things? And at the end of the day, it's just about reaching out and saying, hey, you know, tell me something about you. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Do something different that someone else, that another brand doesn't do. Like that something unexpected. Uh, I have... I have, a, I have a friend, this is not even really business related, but he tries to do that in experiences just every day. Like, kind of like you said, like um, sometimes we'd get in an Uber and he'd ask the driver a question that I'm sure they've never had someone ask them before. Um, just because 
he knew that that would make it a memorable experience for that for that driver right yeah. rather than just the typical drunk people getting in an uber <laughs> you always talk to your uber people man they can tell you the stories <laughs> there's some good stories out there yeah oh so yeah that's that's awesome now i i want to know more about the wow factor book so you wrote a book called the wow factor uh, where you say that you could turn a client experience into your biggest competitive advantage and blow your client's mind. How did you come up with that? Or how did that come about? Well, you know, I was working, I, I started the book, I had the idea for the book, and it's it's been years ago, probably five or six years ago now. And I was working there actually with another entrepreneur, and we were going to be taking a bus tour from Texas to Toronto. We were doing it in 17 days. We were stopping at all of these entrepreneurial spots along the way, and we were going to be teaching and training from this big bus, right? was super excited about all of it. Well, then this little thing called COVID happened, and we thought, oh, it'll be over in a couple of weeks. We'll just postpone. Right. And then it was a few months. And then it was like by next spring, surely we'll be okay. So during that time, um, she had written a lot of books. We had put some stuff together. We said, hey, let's write a, a like a textbook. Let's write a book that we can publish for this trip when we eventually do it. So that's where I got started in the whole on, online you know, writing books and stuff that way. I ended up writing three books during COVID because we had all the time in the world. Wow. I had an ebook, 31 marketing tips every entrepreneur needs to know. I turned that into a beautiful tabletop book. And then the wow factor. The wow factor was never going to be 50 shades of pink, right? This was, <laughs> this was going to be the book that I wanted my clients to have read. Mm -hmm. And it was the first book I started. It was the last book I finished, right? And I have have it here. This is the book that I really wanted people to understand when you take that twist on your marketing dollar, right? That you can invest that money back into your clients and have these amazing customer experiences. You know, you can do gifts, you can do amazing gift parts that you make a part of your program, right? Where it's not, again, it's not just something that's a nice to have. This is something that's actually baked in. It's higher perceived value, you know, just a little in the business side of it. You can make more money because you're doing VIP programs or you're offering a welcome box or you're putting things together for them to do at a retreat, right? Where you're putting these amazing connection points with your clients, again, in a way that they're going to be going, wow, you know, that's crazy. Nobody's ever done that for me. And I've, I've talked to people that have attended programs, that have had programs that they've said, I went to this retreat, I spent, you know, thousands of dollars and we, I got nothing. I didn't get anything like that. Or they give you something like, thank you for something with your logo on it, you know? And it's like, I, you know, there, there's so, there's so many bad logo stories and, and, and Swatchki stories and stuff out there. But when you're looking for that experience, you're actually just putting those pieces in. So when I wrote the wow factor, it's all about making your plans, looking at the connection points. What can you do different to change the customer experience and not leave money on the table while you do it? Yeah. Um, I, my, my mind just explodes with all the possibilities <laughs> of, of things that could happen and, and that would increase the uh, customer experience. It's, and, and just the, like when someone, us as entrepreneurs, we think ROI and I just, I just the see the ROI, like, because you get the customers coming back, you get, you get new customers based on them telling them about the experience. Um, and you, you can just build it into your margins too. Right. So. Absolutely. And that's, and that's the part, you know, people are like, oh, it'll cost money. Or they say, I work a lot with people who re we are dealing with client retention, right? So they've got, they've got a business, they've already got it started, they're kind of going on, but I will tell you, I have people all the time. One of the biggest misconceptions to me is I'll do that when I'm bigger. Right. We see all the Russell Brunson's out there. We see, you know, all of these different pieces and parts going and we think, okay, when I've got a lot of money to spend, then I'm going to do these fantastic things. The secret to that is this. There are things that you can do with 25 people that you cannot do with a sea mm. of entrepreneurs, right? You have 5,000 people in an auditorium. There's only so much you can do. So you have to start, you can look at this when you're just starting out. You can build the dream as to how you do this. And again, if you include it, it's not just something you tack on at the end. This is something that's actually a part of what you are doing. Yeah, it's integral. <laughs> 
Yeah. Um, the, uh, the word that comes to mind as, as you're talking to is amplify. It amplifies everything that you're doing, right? A, as that's a great steward. word. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so um, one of the things, like you have a picture out there that has you kind of messing with a Rubik's cube. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I want to know what a Rubik's cube has to do with building a, creating a unique client experience. You know, let me grab a Rubik's cube real quick. <laughs> so one of the things that I've developed with this, with my program with the wow factor is that we talk a lot about things that you can attach to what you're delivering that make a difference, right? Again, something meaningful and memorable back to the M&Ms. So I, when I started off delivering speeches, one of the things that I talk about is creating the unique customer experience. And the Rubik's Cube became a part of that. Number one, I give Rubik's Cubes to when I go and deliver a speech and if it's a, a small enough group or the, that I can, everyone gets a Rubik's Cube, right? Doesn't have my brand on it. There's a whole story by that, it, but it doesn't have to. The story with the Rubik's Cube is this. When it was developed, number one, talk about entrepreneurship, when it was developed, it was never going to be a kid's toy, right? They, in fact, when they went, when they started it, it this was a mathematical equation that, mm. that a, um, a gentleman by the name of Ernu Rubik, right, that he developed whatever so that he could do this 3D application of something that he was teaching. And it was statistical, well, then they decided that, hey, this would make a cool toy. They even took it to, to um, ha is it Hasbro. I don't remember. One of the big toy manufacturers took it there and they said, no, this is too hard. This, is, this isn't going to be a kid's toy. This isn't going to be something. Like, this is in the top five selling toys of all time. Wow. Now. Okay. But here's what the difference is. Here's the thing. There is only one solution to this cube, right? There's one solution. However, if I would hand you this cube and you would turn it and twist it and mix it all up, there are over 43 quintillion, that's totally a Whoa. number you can Google <laughs> machine it, 43 quintillion different ways that you can mess up a Rubik's cube. Oh. And if I, I gave you this and you turned it like every second, like the world isn't even as old as <laughs> how long it would take you to completely go through 43 quintillion quintillion different possibilities yeah so this just shows you right not everything's been done so if i hand mm -hmm. this to you and you do it one time and you do this chances are statistically speaking no one else has screwed up the rubik's cube <laughs> the way that you just screwed it up yeah right wow. so when you're telling me that you're a part of an insurance conglomerate or whatever, where everybody's selling insurance policies. I've spoke at insurance groups. I've spoke with real estate agents. They all sell the same thing, right? And they think there's no other way of doing this. This is the way we ever, we've always done it. But it's more important how you do business than what it is that you even sell. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you can take that creative element you can take that thing that only you do for your clients that nobody else does in exactly the same way that you're going to do it so that's why the rubik's cube has so, become such an important part of the of the speeches and stuff that i deliver is because of that right we're looking for that unique experience you can have it you can have it where no one else has done it the exact same way yeah that, Isn't that, that crazy? Yeah, I, I love that. And now, <laughs> like how you use the Rubik's Cube to explain that. I would have never thought of it that way. Uh, speaking in those terms, so how much does the does that fit into the, brand? like when we talk about branding, right? Um, everybody thinks of the logo, thinks of the colors, like everything that goes into a brand. How much does the customer experience play into the brand? Well, and... <laughs> I think this is a good a good time for the swag conversation, yes. perhaps. <laughs> so this I have done a lot of swag. I mean, I, I have done swag for people all over the time. And you look at this kind of thing. I have never once reached for the pin jar and said, <laughs> oh, where's that insurance agent? I know I have a pin for him. Yeah. I Another water done, bottle. 
Great. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I have never done that. I mean, I have the pins, you know, we go through them. They're, they're free, they're cheap, whatever. I call swag stuff without a goal. Ooh. Right? Mm -hmm. When you're looking at putting these pieces together, when you're looking at building these connections, it's not about, if it's got your logo on it, chances are it's not a gift. Now it can be small, but chances are it's not, it's not the gift. I mentioned Russell Brunson earlier. Um, one of the things that Russell does, I, I actually spoke at, at an event uh, where he was keynoting and I got the opportunity backstage to kind of visit with him um, virtually, but I got to visit with him and ask him any question. <laughs> People were asking him, you know, about the money and about hmm. the funnels and all the things. I said, Russell, I want to ask you about the t-shirt. Mm. And I said, did you know when you started with the t-shirt, how brilliant that was? And, and I don't know that anybody had ever asked him, you know, I mean, I just, I, I'm me. So, you know, I'm going to ask the things But the reason was, is I, I had written about it in the book before I even got the chance to talk to him. And he said, no, when they first started, you know, they tried different, different renditions of the, of the shirt. For those of you who don't know, or, or maybe not um, familiar with the story, his shirts say um, funnel hacker on his t-shirt. He, he has a company called um, Click Funnels, but the t-shirt says funnel hacker on it. Because they put the funnel hacker on the t-shirts in different, different styles, different, different things that they do, he, it helps the wearer self-identify with the t-shirt. So it's not about the t-shirt. You can go to thrift stores everywhere. You can go to garage sales. Everybody has these t-shirts with people that they've been to events and they have logos. We're not talking about that. We're talking about a way of self-identifying the customer with each other, right? They see each other when they're at events and they know. And this t-shirt is something that is a milestone within his, his um, program. So when you earn the right to wear, to have, to own the Funnel Hacker t-shirt, it becomes a coveted item. I told him, you know, I can't even go, I can't even go on eBay and buy one of these t-shirts. Like people are not giving up these t-shirts. They're keeping them. It's something they're proud of, right? And it's something that, again, they have earned the right to wear. They're not washing the car in these shirts, right? Right. So it's not about swag. It's not about that. It does have his logo on it. It's kind of small, I think on the back or on the lower, lower side, but it's not about Click funnels. It's about the person wearing it. What have they achieved by the time they are finished working with you, doing business with you? What is their life like afterwards? And how can you connect into that in a way that is meaningful and memorable? Yeah, he's created a community and tribe. Um, and it right, his logo is not that big on it, but I guarantee you, with what he's built, they they identify that funnel hacker shirt with him and with click funnels. Right? Oh, absolutely. Without it. <laughs> and they can wear it. I've, I have stopped people. You know, you don't do this with somebody who has a state farm shirt, right? <laughs> I, but I've stopped people that I've seen funnel hacker shirts. It's like, oh my gosh, you know, because I know that I understand that, right? Mm -hmm. I, other people know. So it is, it is something where people are saying, oh my gosh, tell me about your shirt. What's mm -hmm. a funnel hacker? You know, it, it starts that conver those conversation starters, which again, helps you get referrals on the backside of it. We're still making money. You know, mm -hmm. we're still doing the things. This is not something that's just a nice to have, right? Yeah. yeah. People don't want just, at that point, people don't want just the product. They want to be part of that tribe. They want to be a part of that community, right? Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Um, next question. How many connection points do people need to have with their clients? And can you give some examples of those? Oh, Absolutely. You know, earlier, earlier in the interview, we talked about everybody, no matter what, what different product you have, whatever you're selling, your services, any of that, you're, you know, you have areas in there. I have, I found 14 different ways that you can connect with people. I, I have opportunities and stuff that I, that I talk about all the time. There's more than that, right? There, you can come up with the different ones. It's strategic in where do the people need to be made to feel in, inspired? right? You want an inspiration piece in there. You want to be motivational or you want to be celeb celebratory, right? So you're going to celebrate, motivate, or inspire. I think that's easier. <laughs> Your clients. And so where do you look for those places within whatever you're doing? So everybody has a beginning, a middle, and an end. There's three, right? And I won't go through all 14, but there's three of them right there. Then there's milestones, 
you know, letting your customer know this is the, this is where you are in the journey, right? We're going to celebrate you. We're going to do these things that, that make it important for you and for the success that we want you to achieve within the program, right? So you're looking at those opportunities. Maybe you have events and retreats. Those are big, big opportunities, big touch points that you can do. Onboarding. I talk a lot about onboarding. When you're bringing people in, that's like that beginning phases. What can you do to be sure that they're succeeding, right? Now, this might just be a delightful box. We have, we have these surprise and delight boxes that we do for people. It may be something that's just fun. And it's like, oh my gosh, I'm so excited about doing this, right? It may be about bringing people together, or it may be about how you stand apart in your success. I know, I think you've got journals, planners, that sort of mm -hmm. thing. You can incorporate all of that into these success boxes, right? Yeah. So as you're looking for it, you know, maybe people are, you're asking for referrals. That's another touch point. How do you do that? You know, how do you make the people feel important where they want to give you a referral, where they're super excited about it? It's when that they've been seen, right? So I had a quick story. I had a client come to me and she said, you know, Tammy, I, I work with my clients and I send them stuff, but they don't talk about it on social media. They're not doing unboxings. They're not doing all these things. She goes, I, I don't understand what I'm doing wrong. And I said, okay, so you work with mompreneurs, right? Moms that work from home. She said, yes. And I said, okay. So what are you sending them? She said, I'm sending them a sticker with my logo on it for their laptop <laughs> and a handwritten note. Both fine, lovely. Mm -hmm. And then you have acknowledged, you have, you have checked the box, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have checked the box. But what if, Doug, instead of that, you sent that mom a single chocolate chip cookie that said, this is the cookie you don't have to share with anyone. Yeah. Right. Much more so memorable. Now it's an experience, right? <laughs> it's something that you look for. It's something you're going to tell. Have you got the cookie? Have you got the cookie mm -hmm. yet? I know you're new. Have you got the <laughs> cookie yet? You know, whatever it is that you're building, you're looking at how do you build these connections that really make a difference in the journey, right? I do, even in that 14, I'll tell you another one that a lot of people miss out on. And that's your oops connection. What is the oops connection? The oops connection is this. At some time, at some place you've been business long enough, you're going to have something that goes sideways, that goes south, mm -hmm. that isn't going to happen just right. Yep. Do you have an oops plan? No, other than, right? to, say, other than to say sorry. <laughs> yeah, right? But what, I mean, you've done those things. You've had those experiences, right? So what would make it better for your customer or clients, even in those bad times when something happens, right? How are you building that? We had so many things go wrong in COVID, so many different things. I spoke um, at a on a clubhouse. I did a, a, a talk at clubhouse and I visited with a lady who had, um, she was the head of a um, not-for-profit organization. We had this big conversation and it, she said she realized they really hadn't connected with a lot of the people they were, they were um, for uh, um, autism families, families for autistic children. And they really hadn't been reaching out. They really hadn't done anything since COVID because they couldn't meet. They couldn't do the normal things. Well, it's an oops. It's not something that's, you know, there, but they started after, after we talked, you know, I was giving her ideas and things that they could do. She actually tracked me back down on Clubhouse and I was in a completely different room, completely different day. And she said, we went and we did boxes. We did these small boxes that we sent out. She said, it has raised our, our um, donations for the program. It has let people um, know that they were important and that they were thought of after the fact. And not that like, sorry, we haven't communicated because we were all in that space, but it was like, hey, here we are for you now. And how can we help? And just by doing those things, then all of a sudden she said that she had parents calling, just crying, saying, you know, we have felt so alone because we didn't have that support during the times. And they said, here we are now. And, and they took that and they ran with that ball, right? And that made things different because that's the touch points. So it doesn't, you know, there's all these different ways and different places you can connect, but it is, what is it going to matter to your clients? And Talk to them afterwards, find out about, you know, did this work? Did this not work? Let's do something different next time. 
but how do we build this journey that that makes sense? Yeah, I, I like that you touched on follow up there, like follow up and find out how they felt about what you sent them, their experience, all of that. And because we're always looking to improve as entrepreneurs, right? And we can't oh, do that without, without feedback. So absolutely. I went to an event. I have to tell you, I went to an event and it was lovely. It was a retreat. Everyone, when they got there, everybody got a single rose, right? And like the like, bachelor. That's lovely, right? Like the bachelor. <laughs> Everybody got the single rose. Well, about day two, I started noticing like nobody knew what to do with these roses. We're going to be there for like four days. And there were just like half dead roses, like laying in different places. So I went in and grabbed up all the roses and put them in a vase in the front of the table, you know, but at that thing, the idea was there, the concept mm -hmm. was there, but it was like, what do they do with it afterwards? Or if you're mm -hmm. at an event, you know, giving them something really big that they've got to then you know, put into their luggage. How are they getting home with this stuff? It's the little details that you're looking at putting together and that follow-up. Had they asked, you know, it's like, okay, this was a great idea. This was a learning moment. You could have done something really cool with the roses, but because that wasn't follow through, followed through with, right? It wasn't, it didn't have that impact. It didn't have that wow factor. Yeah, maybe right. if they had done something where they say at the end, like towards the end of the event, we're going to bring all these roses together and create something out of the roses or something like that. That would have been really cool. Sure, it would have been really cool. And it would have been a part of it, right? It was mm -hmm. a part of the experience, not just a nice to have. And you see so many people that want to do something. They're like, oh, I want to do something nice. But then again, they're just checking it off the list, right? And so it's not having the impact. It's not having the wow factor. It's not having those pieces put in there that really make a difference with your customer, your clients. Wow. Uh, Tammy, you've delivered so much great information. <laughs> and um, I want to know, like, for my listeners, how can they reach out to you? What do you, like, how do they get your book? Um, let's talk about all that. Like, you, you're going to help them get do away with swag and start creating experiences um so tell them how they can do that absolutely so you can reach out to me at wowtammy.com um i also have wowtammy.com slash book the book is link is available there and i also have something a little bit special for your listeners and, and your viewers and stuff too okay is that i have a list of the 14 ways uh, opportunities that we have for you to connect with your clients. And it's a free PDF. You can download it from that, from that um, wowtammy.com slash book. You can download it from that page. And I talk a little bit more. It's not just a list and stuff on there. I talk a little bit about each of those opportunities and what you can learn and kind of expect. And it is just that mindset shift, right? It is the marketing. It is the pieces that you're doing. You're going to have places for your logo to go. It's not, you know, scrapping everything, but it's making it a part of that overall customer experience, right? That's going to give you higher client retention, more VIP experiences, more ways that you can build this into your program, no matter what size your, your company is. Yeah. Well, awesome. I I'm thank you for that. I didn't even know you were going to offer that. We talked a little bit about it before. And um, so yes, please. We'll provide the links under the, wherever you're seeing this. If it's on YouTube, it'll be in the, in the description. If it's on the podcast, it'll be in the show notes. Um, but please go check that out. Um, I had just, I had been following Tammy and I had not ordered the wow book, but I told her today that I ordered it today. So <laughs> it is on the way because I'm looking forward to, to reading it. It's probably going to end up on the shelf right here with these other, um, great books that I have read. Uh, so I'm, I'm just looking forward to, to learning more about what you do from that book. So, um, and, and Hey, af afterwards, whatever, if you want to have another conversation, let's have another conversation about the, about the book. Yeah, you know, let's find find out, like I said, your takeaways from that, because you everybody brings something to the table. Nobody's going to do things exactly the way that you do them. And that's the way that we want it. Mm -hmm. Right. That's that unique experience. And now it's not just it's not just about having a different product or a program or, or something along those lines. It's not just about building that. It is about building these unique customer experiences. And that's what's going to change you know, throughout this whole journey, whether it's virtual or in person, it doesn't matter. You can still do the same connection points. Yeah. Um, and if I could just emphasize, if you want to start standing out from your competition um, and kind of get in, like, let people see something that's not looks like a copycat, get in touch with Tammy and she, <laughs> she will help you help you do that and stand out from your competition because it is, it is a flooded market depending on what you do. Um, so the more opportunities that you can have to stand out, the better. And, and Tammy can definitely help you with that. So um, thank you. Thank you so much, Tammy. And thank you for having I, me. I always ask the entrepreneurs um, 
kind of on the spot here for parting words for any entrepreneurs, any uh, sort of wisdom that you have to pass on just about the entrepreneur journey in general. You know, I think one of the biggest things that I've learned um, throughout all of it is pivot. You've mm -hmm. got to learn to pivot. You've got to learn to change things. You've got to learn what the market is, what they want versus necessarily what it is that you're wanting to sell. And I don't think any of us have said, you know, right now today was exactly the way that I envisioned this, you know, 20 years ago, this is exactly where I was going to be because it's not, and it's pivoted, you know, there's things that have changed. Um, you know, there's things that happen in the journey itself, whether it's online or in person or whatever, however you're dealing with your customers, it's making them feel like that they're important and understanding where those connection pieces are. Because at the end of the day, that's what matters. It's building those connections. You want the raving fans, but you've got to build those relationships. They don't just happen. Yes, yes. That, that, that is the big thing with me is building relationships. And that's, I'm glad that I met you. We're building this relationship. Um, we and are. That, and, um, thank you for stalking me. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you for finally talking to me and realizing that I'm not just a stalker. <laughs> right. I love that. And I, I, I appreciate, like I said, I really do appreciate we're friends on Facebook and on LinkedIn and I, I don't even know all the places, but you know, it's amazing because we are building these things and you are reaching out to say, Hey, I think that this matters. And, and you are such a great host. Um, even with some of the live things that we've done, you know, la la this last week and stuff, it was amazing and stuff. You're very, very gracious. And I really appreciate your heart in this and for the entrepreneurs, because it's not cut out for everybody, you know, but it is something that's so magical when it comes together and I wouldn't do anything else. Yes, I, 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 I totally agree. And thank you again, Tammy, for being here. And until next time, entrepreneurs, keep moving forward.